Hello there, I'm John Thanasoulis, uh, Professor of Financial Economics at uh, the University of Warwick and the uh, Director of the um, MSc in Central Banking and Financial Regulation. And it's my real pleasure to be able to speak to Paul uh, Robinson and Ben Norman. Paul is the Head of Advanced Analytics at the bank and Ben is a Senior Advisor to the um, Centre for Central Banking Studies uh, at the Bank of England. And they're both here and have very kindly agreed to discuss with me um, big data and behavioral finance, particularly as it relates to the module on the MSc, uh, which goes by the same name. So I'll, I'll put a couple of questions, if I may, to you both and, and get you to explain why the Bank of England sees um, these two disciplines as, as so important. So Ben, why do you think uh, the bank wanted to have some material on behavioral finance uh, talk to their graduates on and on the MSc, on the Global Central Banking Qualification. Thank you so much, John. In really big picture terms, uh, when I think about it, over the last couple of centuries, the study of economics initially focused very much on economic theory and also um, empirical analysis. And the starting point for much of that work is around rationality of individuals and also of markets. And if economists want to introduce an element of less rational human behavior into their analyses, then typically what they did uh, previously was um, focus on economic history. And now I'm a historian originally, and uh, that is a, a really valuable discipline in itself, it has the advantage that it actually happened at least once. Um, but typically, um, as the, as the saying goes, history uh, rhymes rather than repeats itself. And the advantage of looking at something like behavioral economics, behavioral finance, is that over the last 20 or 30 years, economists in this field have put together a more analytical structure for thinking about what happens when that rationality deviates from where traditional economics might think it's about. And that's I think really important for how you then understand the economies. And the same question um, then to you, Paul, I wonder if you could explain a little bit about why the bank felt it was important to have elements of big data uh, taught on the global central banking qualification on the MSC. So I think that from our perspective at the bank, big data is both a massive opportunity and also a real necessity. Uh, they, they often say that uh, economists have physics envy, um, and I think it's, it's probably true. So I always think of big data as a bit like dark matter. It makes up most of the universe, but previously we couldn't see it. Well, now we can uh, because we have big data. So hopefully it'll be able to give us a much better understanding of developments in the macro economy, the financial system, and individual institutions who we regulate, all of which are crucial in terms of making good policy. So that's the opportunity. I think there's also a necessity, and that really comes from the fact that institutions uh, outside the bank, both in the UK economy and across the world, are making much more use of big data. That is going to affect the financial system, it's going to affect the way the economy works more generally, and we really need to understand those developments. So, so that's really clear, uh, and it's very, very helpful. Um, could you perhaps sort of give the, the viewers of, uh, uh, of this an idea of, you know, a little bit more concretely where, let, let's start perhaps with you, Paul, with big data, um, where that might be used by some of your colleagues in the bank. Actually, I think it's used quite broadly across the institution. Most areas of the bank have analytical needs and most of those analytical needs um, rely on data and rely on as accurate and timely data as possible. In our the regulatory part of the organization, the Prudential Regulatory Authority, they receive a vast amount of information uh, on a daily basis from the companies that they supervise. That comes in all kinds of different forms. Some of it is numerical, but a lot is text, uh, PDFs, board reports, minutes of meetings, etc. They need to understand these and they also need to make sure that the Qualitative information, such as the text, can be combined with the quantitative information. That really is the realm of big data. Uh, absolutely, thank you. Um, 
Uh, ben, a, a similar question on the um, behavioral finance side. I mean, could you give some concrete examples of, of where you think an understanding of behavioral finance is, is important for your colleagues at the Bank of England? So uh, one area uh, that has become really prominent for central banks over the past couple of decades is their communication. It's fraught for potential uh, for um, you know, misinterpretation. Um, and uh, actually combining some of um, Paul's techniques around text mining to understand how uh, a central banks' choice of words then impact on the markets and the behaviors that that then induces in the market participants is actually a very good illustration of how actually the two disciplines of um, uh, big data and behavioral uh, can uh, come together uh, in a particularly uh, compelling uh, piece of analysis. Just to, to round off, perhaps um, you, you might be willing to give a sort of an example of a bank policy which has been affected or altered by either behavioral finance or big data uh, and the techniques that you've been talking about. Well, um, why don't I um, actually give a very big picture? Uh, if you look back at how the uh, global financial crisis unfolded back in 2008 and the run up to that, the behaviors of market participants were not properly understood by the policymakers in advance of it. And certainly all the models showed very high impact, very low probability events such as a global financial crisis as being infinitesimally small in likelihood. And so there was just wasn't that focus uh, that maybe there should have been when actually uh, uh, the herd behavior that behavioral economists study uh, is of the sort that makes those really high impact events a bit more likely than those economic models, those traditional economic models would have suggested. And so that is a, an area where I think with the benefit of hindsight, we have understood the need not to rely on purely traditional models, but to try and find ways of factoring in that uh, irrational human behavior, however you want to describe it. Thank you. And similarly for you, Paul, um, perhaps you could give a concrete um, example of a big data project which has had an important impact on, on the work that the bank does. Sure. Um, so let me give you one from 2014. Um, at, at that point, the UK housing market was showing a lot of uh, signs of liveliness, possibly even overheating. So house price inflation had picked up quite significantly. So one of the things that we did was to combine a very detailed data set coming from our colleagues at the Financial Conduct Authority, which had every uh, owner-occupied mortgage, which had been granted in the UK for a number of years, uh, together with land registry data, Northern survey data. And we got a very, very detailed map of the UK um, in terms of mortgages being granted. And something that the FPC was particularly interested in was high loan to income mortgages, so where people have, let's say they've got an income of 20,000 and they've got a 100,000 mortgage, that's a ratio of five. That's quite high historically. And so they were concerned that if there were too many of these high loan to income ratio mortgages, that could lead to potential fragility down the line. So what we did was we looked at every single one of these mortgages across the country and it showed a, a super interesting thing, which was that if you go back to the financial crisis, 2009, the depths of the crisis, effectively no one was lending high loan to income mortgages. It was, the whole country was in a kind of housing market freeze. And as you pan forward to 2014, what had happened was that the country as a whole remained pretty cool, but London had shown a very significant increase in these large mortgages. Uh, London and parts of the Southeast. From this, the FPC concluded this wasn't really a national phenomenon. What was really happening was that something was going on in the housing market in the Southeast, London in particular, which was such a large part of the economy that it was affecting the national statistics. And given that information, along with an all, all kinds of other analysis, they introduced a, a policy where any individual institution could only learn, lend a certain proportion of its mortgages at a high LTI, loan to income ratio in any quarter. 
And that I think was significantly informed by this very detailed granular work that we've done. Thank you. Paul and Ben, I, I think that's been fascinating. It, it, it's clear, you know, as we knew, that behavioral finance and, and the techniques involved in big data and the advanced analytics that, uh, that you lead play a really important role. Uh, and I can see why, why it's valuable to the bank and why the bank would be keen to have it uh, taught through the um, module that we have on this topic in the MSC in um, Global Central Banking and Financial Regulation. So, it only remains for me to thank you so much uh, for your time today uh, and express my gratitude uh, that, that you can make it. Thank you. Thank you.